Thank you for uh, giving me a few minutes to sort of go over this. I wish I could be here under different circumstances, but uh, this is one of those things that very much affects my operation, our operation, and the future of peg access nationwide. And, and I, I know that Wendy probably has briefed you, but I'll just give you a brief overview. The Federal Communications Commission is considering a rule change that, if enacted, could devastate funding for public access television across this country. Uh, as we know, the way it's funded now is anybody who has a Comcast account pays in a cable access fee, essentially a franchise fee. That money goes to you, and then we bill you quarterly, and it goes to us for operation. The FCC rule change, and there's a couple of, of components to it, but the one that I think is most significant is, right now, under the current rules, the cable company has to give us access to channels for free. 12, 15, 23 are free to us. Uh, if this ch rule change is enacted, it would allow the cable companies to effectively charge for the space on those channels and deduct the cost of that from the franchise fees. So the franchise fees, instead of going to the town, would go back to Comcast. And the percentage is un unclear at this point, the exact hit. Some are estimating it could be a 40% hit. Some are saying it could be a 90% hit. Some stations could have their access uh, money completely wiped out by this. So it's, it's probably the single greatest threat to this medium of public access television since the Cable Act of 84, certainly. And the fact that you just signed a 10-year cable contract with Comcast is moot. And Wendy and I disagreed on this, but it is moot because that contract is based on FCC regulations as they exist when signed. If the FCC changes the rules, then they can take our money basically and give it back to Comcast. So it's a pretty significant situation. Now, this was one of those things that got trotted out there very quietly by the federal government. The initial approval was given in September. That started the window on a 90-day or a 60-day comment period that was supposed to have expired in November, November 14th, I believe. The FCC extended that to this Friday, the deadline. So if anybody wants to comment on this, the deadline is Friday. Um, Wendy and I have been on an email thread with a bunch of different people who have been weighing in, and the, the general feeling is, at least at this point, that the FCC may hold off on making a ruling on this until next year. They could very easily make the ruling this month, which would affect the first quarter funding, theoretically anyway, from Comcast. Uh, Ed Markey, our senator, has gotten 10 signatures of his colleagues on a motion to stop this. It's very similar to net neutrality in the sense that the Senate was able to check the FCC on net neutrality with a vote of the Senate, a majority of senators, a majority being 50 plus one. Um, I think the Senate could weigh in on this, but the difference here is that public access television, though it's important to us and important to towns, is not a sexy topic. It's one of those things like, oh, you know, if, if it disappears, people won't know about it until they can't watch the select board meeting the following week. And then you'll get calls like crazy, where is the select board meeting, where is the polka, where is the sports? It's not a sexy topic. It's, for some reason, it's not been a big story in any kind of media. Uh, and, and it hasn't been a big story on the radar of the usual advocacy groups that scream bloody murder when Jim Acosta gets his press credentials ripped uh, from the White House, <coughs> but you're talking about ripping local access television from every community in the country and no one's blinking an eye about it. So we have to do what we can as communities to let the FCC know that this is not okay, which is why I'm asking this board to follow the lead of Conway Sunderland and tonight Waitley and send a letter to the FCC saying keep your hands off our public access. Um, I actually believe it's a huge, huge deal. And um, so Wendy, thank you for putting together this letter. And um, I certainly wanted to bring it up to the Rural Policy Advisory Commission tomorrow night because I think it's really a huge thing. We, we are required and, and I mean, I think it's very important that people watch or have the ability to watch cable, um, our meetings on cable, and that we have a record of them. But we're required by the open meeting law 
and, the, and Freedom of Information Act to, to provide all this information. And I don't know how we're going to do that without th this, you know, cable, you know, you taping our meetings. I, 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 this is just, to me, it's a horrible, horrible position that we're in. And this is so serious. I think there are people that work on my staff who don't understand why I'm so adamant about covering as much government as possible. Well, who's watching that? Who watches that stuff gavel to gavel? I got news for you. Um, whether they watch it or not, I it's know that, I know the town officials depend on us. Like I've walked into the Sunderland Town Administrator's Office on numerous occasions and had her watched her watching our meeting coverage to get minutes. And they change the rules on you. And if the FCC changes the rules on us, um, it's it's not going to be a, pro, a, a service we'll be able to provide. And another part of this that is not part of the story, but it should be, is that a lot of kids have gone through our program. Kevin Murphy's done a great job at outreach at Frontier. Um, and a lot of young people have gone through FCAT's student program and are producers now. And I can tell you from experience as a member of local media that there are absolutely no areas left where young people can get an entry into hands-on experience working in media technology, except public access television. Radio stations aren't an option anymore. You know, you can create a podcast at home, but where are you going to learn how to edit, do all the things, create a story, craft a story, stage a meeting, run a concert, run a basketball game? It's an important service. It's an underutilized service for sure. Not a lot of people know about it, which is why it's not a sexy topic, why this isn't a front page story. But I'm doing my best in whatever rude, crude way I can to get the story out there as much as possible because it's really important, not just for FCAT's future, but for the future of all these access stations, countrywide, nationwide, countywide. I, I agree. So uh, since I'm not really up on this topic, are you, are you saying that the FCC is just changing the rules or are they being pressured by Comcast to change the rules? It's absolutely something that Comcast and other cable companies have been lobbying for because people are cutting okay. the cord. And when you lose revenue, any company's not just going to stand and pass. They're going to do what they can to recoup whatever revenue they can. This means, I mean, our budget is $160,000 in change a year from four towns. Not a lot of money to cover four towns, by the way. But if you take all the money that goes to all the peg access stations nationwide, we're talking about millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, potentially, that would go back to the cable companies. So yeah, they've been pushing for this for years because they, they're, they're a dying industry. And I'm going to tell you right now, if this happens, this medium will never come back. I don't care who wins the White House in 2020, how the FCC changes, it will never come back. And I don't think people understand that. I know. Do uh, now you say these funds come from uh, people who have Comcast bills. Will a fee on the Comcast bill disappear, or probably not? Probably not. It'll probably just get diverted. Uh, and that's the a funny thing about this. One of the arguments in favor of this rule change is that, well, and it's a hidden cost to cable people. People who have cable, uh, these franchise fees are a hidden cost they aren't told about. The other argument is that towns like this one, I'm not saying this one specifically, but that towns take this money and don't use it for peg access. They use it for to patch roads or to build sidewalks or to pay for it. It's not, of course it's not true. It's ridiculous. It's a straw man. But that's the argument that's being used by advocates for this change. So, uh, yeah, I, the, the, the franchise fee won't go away. It'll just go back to Comcast. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I posted it, and you saw some of the feedback that I got. People were saying, well, the, you know, the mediums are changing, and... You know, how do you respond to that? Now, people, media is changing. They're going elsewhere for information, not television. So what, uh, what are the options for local coverage? Or well, I mean, if, if, if the worst case scenario were to happen and, they, and all our funding were to go away, you still have the infrastructure here to be able to run meetings if you want to. You won't have anybody to do it. One of the things that we've done since I took over at FCAT and made a, a, a real priority is to create a YouTube presence. And, and I do believe the industry is heading in that direction. I think cable is a dinosaur. 
it's our dinosaur, but it's a dinosaur, and eventually the technology will change. <coughs> but the funding mechanism for towns like this to be able to have access to the airwaves or have a budget to be able to have somebody record these meetings and provide them to people, uh, that very much it should remain, if possible. Um, I can tell you that I'm on the Greenfield Community Television Board of Directors as well. Greenfield has a municipal light plant uh, high-speed internet service. They want to put GCTV's channels on their new TV product, which is being rolled out next year. I'm not saying that Deerfield wants to go with an MLP and try and do, it, do a, a high-speed thing that way, but if you did, that would be a mechanism where, where FCAT could exist in the future. But the truth of the matter is, technology being what it is, the funding mechanism to keep this agency going has to be through this process. And if it's, if it's taken away by FCC rule changes, I, I don't think that this community and the chair of the finance committee is here, I'm pretty sure this community is not gonna be wild about the idea of making $80,000 in taxpayer money available to keep public access on in Deerfield. But that's the, that's the situation you're gonna find yourself in. It's going to ultimately be, if you want to keep this service, if they cut the funding or they change the mechanism, then you're going to have to pay for it. Now, there is a business model in some towns like Hadley where Hadley does run the public access station. So it, it can be done that way. Uh, I would not say it's the best way to go about it. I wouldn't say the mechanism is necessarily uh, effective. And I think that every year, you're going to be, Never is a town going to have enough money to be able to do everything. And access would probably be relatively low on the priority scale at that point. This is the best fiscal model for preservation of this service. But it's also a pot of money that cable companies can get if they can get the FCC to change the rules, which is why we are where we are. What is really disturbing is, you know, if you look around, there's no reporter. We don't get, very, you know, accurate coverage in the newspapers anymore. And people don't get the newspaper hardly. Anymore. Well, this is the argument. And so I, this I, is, like, huge. Yeah, I, I said this to the Conway Select Board, too. You know, I, and nothing against my friends at the paper. I have people there I know and I've oh, known I know, for but years. They just know but we're, the, we're it, man. We're the only game in town when it comes to gavel-to-gavel -to -gavel coverage. And we don't report on this stuff. We just put it out there <coughs> and let people view it. Sometimes we'll do a, a special here and there where we talk about individual issues. But for the most part, you know, this is a service we provide and we work hard at. And the, the ones that I feel the worst for are the kids that work for me because we have a, a great group of dedicated people. I don't have a huge staff, but the people that I have are tremendously dedicated, very talented. They take it seriously. They work hard at it. And they're going to be the first ones fired because the FCC wants to stick more money in the pockets of big companies. That's a travesty as far as I'm concerned. It's an absolute travesty, which is why I'm being such a pain about going in front of boards like yours and screaming to the rooftops that this has to be saved. No, I wanted you to come. I, no, I've been I worried about this. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak on this. I, I've been doing a lot of speaking on it. I've been going to different towns outside of this area uh, and talking to people in Montague and in various communities to try and get somebody to be aware of this. There are people in my own profession who don't know about this. You know, I, I spoke in front of a cable advisory committee and they were like, what? They're going to do what to the funding? It's, it's not on the radar of anybody. And when it happens, it's going to happen fast and you're not going to see it coming until you start getting calls asking you why your select board meetings aren't on live on TV anymore. And on this letter that we wrote, Wendy, that uh, MB docket number 05, is that what the, the uh, FCC yeah, You have to make sure you by? put the yeah. docket number in there, otherwise it is yeah. going to... Uh, so that relates to this particular... Yes. Okay. Very much. Um, I make a motion that we send this letter. Oh, can we, sure. um, after we sign it, can you scan it and get it down there? Uh, there's this, um, I've been in touch with Bill August, who I've known for a long time. He used to be a cable commissioner here in Massachusetts. I guess we don't even have one anymore. We don't need it, right? And he's a cable lawyer and works for municipalities with contracts and stuff. And he's, he's been great. You know, I ask him a question, he writes back, I send it out to Chris and others. At any rate, there's a very specific way to get this into, in front of them, and I'll take care of that tomorrow. You sign it. The actual letter will go to the uh, 
senators and Congress right. congressmen. I mean, I, I, I'm very much in favor of sending that letter as well. But I, I think, since I, I really don't have a good background in this, <clears throat> don't we negotiate these contracts every so often? Yeah. So yeah. couldn't we just, if Comcast goes down this road and say, look at now, you know, you can take this money. We need something saying. else to do. You know, I, you I have to refund this. I, I would refer you oh. to your own contract. And I think if you look at that contract, you'll find language that says this contract is contingent on FCC regulations remaining the same. Right. So if the FCC changes the rules in mid-game, so the contract's not worth the paper it's written on. Right. So we, then we, we would could get a new contract. I mean, but what leverage do we well, have over Comcast the, to say you can't sell the, it in our the town? The meat we of the issue so, is a little bit yeah. confusing and difficult to... Uh, Articulate and it has to do with the value of how they the uh, being they're being allowed to count in kind not in kind but um, what's the term? Um, no, it counted as in kind contribution. Yes, in kind contrib and and it decreases the value right. of um, what what we have been getting or all of the communities around the country have been getting from their cable providers, and <coughs> it will, it's been determined from analysts who've looked at this that that will allow them not to pay very much to communities at all, which will undercut the funding for There's the There's also language in this rule change regarding rights of way uh, for cable companies. And I'm not entirely clear on how that works. But the, one of the arguments in favor of this is it would allow, quote, unquote, competition, which is always what you hear when you hear deregulation talk. It's fostering competition. So in theory, a charter or one of those other companies could come in here and challenge Comcast provided they wanted to build their entirely their own infrastructure in here and, and no one's gonna do that. So it's it's again a facetious argument. And before you vote, I'll just say one more thing. Um, if the worst case scenario happens and the funding is affected starting in the first quarter of next year, FCAT will not cease operations completely. We do have some money in the bank. I've been very, very careful with our funding. We we've spent not a lot of money. Um, we spend money on basic office stuff, insurance, that kind of thing, but we also spend, the bulk of our money gets spent on personnel to go out and do this work, to cover these meetings, to cover these events. We've got enough money probably to last a year if all the funding were cut. Um, there's enough cash in the bank right now to be able to cover all expenses for probably a year. And at that point, if it does happen, we can figure out and try to talk about a way. There's always underwriting as a possibility, getting sponsorship. Um, I'm not wild about going down that road because I think that the, the business community, the business people in these communities have a tough enough time. You know, they're operating hand to fist. We appreciate the support we get for things like high school basketball and frontier sports and those kinds of things. But I would hate to have to go out hand out, hand out you know, trying to get business owners in small communities to, to save access. How do you get, I mean, if this does happen, uh, what would the cable companies charge you to use the channel 15? Well, this is the billion dollar question, literally. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what that would look like in terms of what the cost would be. It can pretty much be anything they say it is, right. which makes this doubly dangerous. We're not going to end up owing them any money. That wouldn't work. Right. But they could very easily say, okay, so Deerfield gets $80,000 a year. Well, we're going we're gonna to say it costs $70,000 to provide the channels. So now 80000 goes to ten. For us, it doesn't affect capital money, but then again, the capital money is pennies on the dollar compared to the operating funds. Yeah, it's a serious situation. Yeah. I wouldn't be I here if it, it wasn't. I get it. Um, is there any possibility they go to local origination again, or not likely to? Do, which means they would actually run the Comcast would run its own. I I don't know. I, I certainly don't. I don't think Comcast is going to do anything until they see what the FCC does. I think at that point, the situation with Comcast will clarify, but this isn't as much about Comcast it's as, as it is about the federal government trying to rip the rug out from under a service that should, they should be working to foster and encourage. And I, you know, I, I don't want to make this too much about politics, but there have been a number of voices of dissent that have come out of public access. Amy Goodman, David Pakman, people that are critics of specifically this administration's policies. I'm not saying that that's the reason this is happening. What I'm saying is that it's a happy accident. And it's one of those things that just makes it 
it's, it's sort of a value-added thing for people that don't like criticism of certain policies and certain ideologies. So that's just one other angle that I feel like I need to bring out there. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate the information and stuff. And we'll sign this letter and get it going. Yeah. Yep. Uh, thank you for your second. support. I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.